Welcome to our session. Welcome to TLM's partners meetup on a rational approach to video game development. I'm Joanna, I'm part of the Landing Jobs team and I will be your host for today. As we are waiting for everyone to join, I hope you are well seated and ready for the next hour. If you can hear any of us during a certain time, let us know in the chat and we'll try to understand what is happening. We still have one speaker joining us. We were having a bit of a trouble with the audio. So any troubles you might find, tell us on the chat. We'll keep an eye on it. Also, tell us on the chat where you are watching us from, because I'm in, here in Lisbon, Portugal. We have Alexis in Montreal, Canada, and we have Jacob in California. And we were just discussing before the session going live how beautiful California is. <laughs> Um, just to, to give you a bit of, a, of an introduction for those of you who don't know yet, TLM Partners is a unique cloud studio that develops Play Anywhere experiences and publishes original games. The TLM Partners developers are located throughout the world, as you can see, and they seek out, foster, and encourage the creative spark of future developers by leveraging the expertise to teach and mentor them to their greatest potential. Their knowledge, passion, and creativity are the foundation of the vision and success of TLM partners. And we already have Dietmar here with us. I hope right now the audio sound, everything is working properly. If something is not working, we have the chat so everyone can tell us that something is happening. It's the reality of remote events right now, although we are like one year doing this, we have been doing this for a year. We have here with us Jacob, CEO of TLM partners to give us an overview of the company and the technologies. Alexis, head of creative, that will present a rational approach to video game development. And joining them for the last part of the session, the Q&A, we have Dietmar CEO. For the ones that are just joining us, welcome. I'm Joanna, I'm part of the Landing Jobs team. And we are here with Jacob, Alexis, and Dietmar from TLM Partners. They are going to start the presentation on a rational approach to video game development. If you have any questions throughout the session, feel free to do them in the Ask a Question button you have in the bottom right of Crowdcast and we'll answer them in the end. And also, if throughout the session you want to comment something on chat, feel free to do so, and we'll also keep an eye on it. Jacob, Lex, and Dietmar, thank you so much for being here with us today. The stage thank is you. now yours. Absolutely. So let me tell you a little bit about TLM. So um, I've been making video games now for over 30 years, and um, I've successfully sold several uh, companies to Electronic Arts, uh, Microsoft and, and, and many others. Um, in 2017, shortly after uh, I had um, exited my last uh, video game company, we had sold to a private equity firm. Um, we put together TLM Partners and TLM's goal, um, sorry, I'm getting major feedback. Let me see if I can fix this. Your voice is too powerful for this platform, Jake. Say again. Your voice is too powerful for this platform. You're, you're well, it's, killing. It's hearing. <laughs> and now we lost that. Jake. I'm here. Hopefully, I'm here. You are here. Okay, Can perfect. You, you are here. <laughs> that's because uh, are, are you using an Apple product to do this video conference? That's why. No, it's I, I should have done a PC product. <laughs> yeah. All right. It's but, it's like uh, when I have I have a few devs on the team that are using and they 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 try to convince us to use an Apple computer as as devs, and I found I I find it so cute. It's yeah. like listen listen it's good to go to the coffee shop. You can't use it to create games. Nice try though. <laughs> All right. Well, let's try this and see. If Is this that works. better? Um, I don't know. We'll know in a second. <laughs> I think this is better. Uh, anyway, let's just uh, let's... Yeah, major feedback. Yeah, now we have the major feedback. Maybe we will mute uh, mute ourselves and just Jacob keeps the the mic on. Maybe the feedback will be better. Well, yeah, let's try. This this seems to be working. So I'll just yeah. have to listen to myself uh, in in the background. It's driving me a little bit nuts. Anyhow, so uh, in 2017, uh, we were approached, but I was approached by uh, some executives at Sony Japan, and uh, it's um, uh, 
to create a new piece of middleware, uh, very specifically uh, built on and around uh, in physics. And so uh, at the time, what they had asked for is, uh, or there's great paranoia at Sony about um, the fact that there was a new console uh, coming out and that Microsoft was not going to be supporting uh, Havoc physics. So they asked us to sort of build a, a competing platform for that. We did such a great job that Sony took our prototype up to Microsoft and clubbed them over the head and said, look, um, we're going to throw you out of the, we're going to compete directly with you in physics if you don't support us with your Havoc physics engine. Needless to say, uh, Microsoft decided to support uh, the PlayStation 5 with, with Havoc physics. And then um, we no longer had a customer, and but we had a whole lot of engineers. Uh, that led us to sort of look around the industry and see what creative things we could go and do. And we uh, ended up going and starting to build uh, cross-play games, very specifically uh, for some companies like uh, Proletariat, who just launched Spellbreak last year. Spellbreak is a direct competitor to Fortnite. We went, hmm, this is really interesting. There's a whole lot of people that enjoy playing cross-play games. And so we started building more and more underlying infrastructure and technology. Um, we continue to do our work for higher projects like we had done with Sony. And so now we're at a point where, we, where we're starting to publish our own games. And so if you look at our uh, five-year plan this year, we're going to continue growing our work for higher business. Uh, last year, we did 800% uh, year-over-year growth. We expect to double again this year. Uh, and we expect to double again next year. So our work for hire goes up. Next year, it goes flat as we launch our first three titles uh, that are our own original IPs. The year after that, we expect to do about five titles, and the year after that, about eight. Um, we are very literally becoming the Netflix of cross-play video games. Uh, we're becoming very well known for it technologically. We've got companies like uh, Activision that we've partnered with on Call of Duty. Uh, Warner Brothers that we've partnered with on their Batman title and their Back for Blood title, and there's more in the pipeline. Um, we are very actively going after esports and PC and console games, and the reason's pretty straightforward. Uh, for years and years and years, if you are a PlayStation uh, a gamer and developer, you could only play with PlayStation. Uh, Alexi was just uh, you know teasing me that Mac versus PC. If you are a Mac guy, you can only play with Mac people. If you're a PC guy, you can only play with PC people. If you are a mobile developer, you can only play with mobile. What crossplay really enables us to do is any one of those can play with anyone else. So instead of having 800 million console users and 600 million PC users and 80 million Nintendo Switch users, you've got 2 billion people that you can go and play with. So the, the audience for our games is so much larger and so much more powerful. Um, we've got underlying technology. We've got some amazing people from Zynga, from EA, from Ubisoft, IDOS, Electronic Arts, Take-Two. I think we've got an executive from almost every publisher out there. I've got some of the smartest engineers. Uh, we, uh, you know, as we said at the top of the hour, we are actively looking for the next generation of game developers. And we're looking outside of North America, outside of Central Europe, and we're really trying to find new places. Um, just recently, last month, we hosted an international game jam in Mexico City uh, with the Technica de Monterrey, which was uh, six different university campuses where we funded and hosted uh, an event. And kids were creating, over the course of a week, uh, video games. I will tell you, three of the 15 games submitted, we're going to publish. We've hired five of them as interns. And that's just an example of how much we want to engage people that are not, uh, that are underserved communities, underserved marketplaces, South America, Asia, Eastern, Southern Europe, places where you wouldn't normally go. And um, we're finding amazing sparks, amazing genius, amazing creativity, designers, artists, engineers, uh, and everything in between. Um, Portugal for us, is uh, a natural place for us to sort of land. It's on the westernmost uh, point of the continent, and it's uh, it's an easy place for us uh, to sort of expand our footprint. Today, we're in um, we have uh, our core companies in North America. We have a subsidiary in Canada. 
We have a subsidiary in Ireland. Uh, and in total, we're in 19 different countries. Um, we try and align around the Eastern time zones just so that we have good overlap. It's a little bit harder on people in Asia, but uh, for the most part, uh, we see uh, tremendous growth ahead of us. And um, that's, about, that's about it for right now. Let's see if people can still hear me. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. we heard you great. It was amazing. You were, and you couldn't hear yourself. You couldn't hear anything. No, so you, then, you were, I couldn't hear myself gone. twice, which is really awesome. distracting. So. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you so much, Jacob. Alexis, please go on with your presentation. <laughs> Thank you okay, so much. sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, that's actually a great opening to the, to, I guess, to the dream and the, um, the origin of the whole idea. And I, I just want to start by saying something which I find really interesting. So I, I personally joined TLM. It was back in, I think it was early October, I think it was. So I came after the initial phase that was the middleware development and some of the initial initiatives that, that he had. It was before a lot of the game, sort of the game-centric development, the game growth at the time. And I actually recalled when we, we spoke earlier that summer um, how TLM was initially envisioned as a cloud company, like a cloud studio. <laughs> and that was like the initial conversation was pre-COVID. And, and I know like, so I've been in games um, for over 15 years. I've been very lucky, uh, born and raised in Montreal, which is incidentally became sort of like the Hollywood of games. There's like so many studios here. It was due to tax credit. There was a lot of, of uh, people working in 3D and the government just had amazing programs and the, and the city became this, this burgeoning, amazing sort of place for, for game development. So I worked for Ubisoft here, the, the, the absolutely huge studio in Montreal. It's like over 3000 people now uh, for, I was there for 13 years. And then, and then I moved on to smaller companies. I wanted to try different things, do double A development. I touched VR when I was when I before I left Ubisoft. I I started working in VR as well. And as a as a game designer and a creative, I got really excited with VR. Although it was a bit early, so I left. and wanted to try some of that, and eventually came across Jake's route by working on on VR and on some. I'm excuse my English, some super weird shit that we're doing in terms of exciting products and VR and uh, amongst other things, right? And so I so I recall that, so being in um, being in games for you know, a while and, and also like working a lot on the design processes and teaching design process, I'm, I'm a really, I'm a, I'm a people person, like really I, I'm fueled by the contact and the proximity with other people. So I'm part of that generation that really did not believe that we could do game development as a cloud company. I didn't really believe it like strongly. We, we initially had, uh, we started a new thing. We had the whole team here in Montreal and, and then COVID happened. <laughs> and then everything went to hell. And at, incidentally, at the same time, most of the team I was working with, we got merged and integrated into TLM and um, started working on some, again, like I said, some, some VR and some exciting stuff. And essentially that dream initially that you had or that vision that potentially a cloud studio could, could work as an idea before you had to defend and explain and you had to bring out these corporate slides with numbers to convince people. And now it's it's been our life for one year. Um, and and yeah, I mean, even like the biggest project we have right now is almost 60, 60 something heads, and they're like spread all over the place. And of course, there's some hardship to to doing remote and cloud, but um, I think mostly we're adapting. Um, we got to be careful, like to not to duplicate every meeting. Every meeting bec becomes <laughs> yeah. a half and a half an hour call, right? Every every time you want to talk to someone, it's like half an hour call, and you're scheduled becomes completely retarded. But if we control that, um, it's it's a surprising it's just a surprising idea. The same way that we had to convince people that doing crossplay and and VR social experiences and these things we had to convince people pre-COVID, and now people are running after us because they want to be able to to have these uh, these digital experiences. Because I mean. It's not. I mean, it's not going to be exactly solved tomorrow. This thing, right? So, I mean, we're. Uh, it's going to change the the real the way we approach. Anyways, I just thought it was um, 
it was a really interesting twist, t- t- twist of events that uh, it, it it went to, to, to develop this way. I think is the word you're looking for. Huh? Serendipity. Serendipity. Yeah, you're right. There was some, the, the stars aligned, and then it the just made aligned. sense. And it just made sense. And now I mean that, and and now we're 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 now we look super fresh. smart and genius. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> also very tired. No, so um, yes. but so anyways, the, dialing back on the the idea of um. Of rational development, I just wanted to take a bit of time and explain um, part of the of my role within the company, and so part of the approach that we have on uh, on game development, depending on the product. And so to to make um, and I'm not sure like there's a lot of people here. I'm not sure who's like more on it uh, working on a technical. Like do we have engineers? Maybe some people touching design. I, I'm sure some people doing a bit of art or on the side, like. Uh, on smaller teams, people tend to touch a lot of, of topics. So, I would you will probably relate to part of what I'm uh, explaining. But so I'm so I come from design. I come as a, as a game designer, uh, and then as a game director and as a creative director. So I've always been tackling with issues of uh, creativity. I think it's the um, creativity is the is, is a harsh mistress, right? Because mm-hmm. everyone talks about it, everyone needs it, but no one really knows what it is. So I've been I've been toying around with those concepts for a while, and when I was in uh, Ubisoft working for Ubisoft, that was in 20, 20, uh, 2009, It was initially, we came across this issue um, at the time, which was that gaming was perceived as um, as a, as a niche entertainment, right? That was over ten years ago. It's not the case anymore. But it was there was an internal worry in Ubisoft that um, that we needed to create games that could speak to everyone and anyone. And then we had this issue of wondering how can we make games accessible and fun to fun to play for everyone. And at the same time, we also had this other discovery, which is that game design as a profession was the ugly duckling of game development because engineers came from, you know, their engineering programs, artists already worked in 2D and 3D prior to games. Managers came out of manage- management schools and whatnot. So we had this issue where, where do designers come from? Think about it for a second, like tr- like in terms of industrial tradition, where do game designers come from? They come from nowhere. Game designers are a bunch of misfits without a profession without a formalized training. And so I remember starting as a game designer and the guy, one guy on my team had done, he had done a degree in uh, uh, marine biology. I had another guy who had done compar- comparative literature. So he was a specialist of Russian lit- literature. And I, I came from acting and studying uh, history of Eastern, Eastern Asia. So, Designers were coming from all over the place. They weren't formalized. Um, and that was, oh, Jake, are you using an Apple keyboard? No, Microsoft. Oh, I could tell because it's, uh, it, it, makes a, it makes a very am I PC. Clicking, am I clicking and clacking? Yeah, yeah you, are, you are. Sorry. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I thought I would be an ass about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, game designers leave, need love too. Someone says, yeah, I agree. So the designers were coming from, all over the place. They weren't formalized. There was at the time there wasn't a single school teaching game design. We were very focused on um, the professional requirements. So level designers were starting to learn the tools. Um, and and now you need to imagine at the time, like Ubisoft as a company was was really really pushing on AAA gaming. So we were increasing the investment in every game. The teams were getting really big in size, like over 100, 200 people on, on a game. And it, it got much worse since. And so there was this internal anguish of realizing, so wait a minute, we're throwing a $100 million plus on a title with 300 people. And who's determining the content of that game? In part, the game designers. And so the question was, OK, so you're telling me that we're we're investing all those efforts on the sort of decisions of of these designers that have no technicality, no training. They don't know what they're doing. Basically, it was seen at the time that game designers were just pushing opinions, right? Like you do something because it's cool. 
or you do something because you've you've seen it in another another game, which we do we still do a lot, or you do something because you've done it before, like in a previous game, and that was the extent of design. So there was a big internal push at the time to start working on what became a cursus called rational design, and it was a it was a big investment by Ubisoft at the time. Like and and I took that's where I discovered and I got the love for processes as a designer. Like how do I formalize my trade how do i uh, become more technical and and so at the time we created a full program it was a two weeks training like full day like the nine days of eight hours of training to get the first pass on the rational design process and ubisoft you know being french rented a castle north of paris of course because that's what french people do apparently and they flew people from all over the world in the castle ground and and then we had this two weeks training and we did this for a year and a half every two weeks we got 20 something people coming in the castle so the idea at the time was to create a critical mass of designers and gameplay programmers and and writers mostly that would be trained in a new way to design and the idea was basic it's saying Imagine for a second an architect that doesn't understand technical notions of, of you know, of the way the, the weight is distributed on a structure, the 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 you know the hardness of materials, like etc. Right? Imagine an architect that only designs building by doing a drawing and going like this building is really beautiful i like it and then they build it and then people die because they they go inside the structure that is not technically sound and um or i guess another image we use a lot was even for musicians you can improvise you can learn but there's a limit there's some point where if you want to increase the level of your creativity you need to be technical you need to learn to read and write the music you need to to start learning about the history of music in general of looking at other composers etc you need to be able to fuel your your instinct and your passion by uh, by using something that is technical and there was a lot of resistance at first because designers were basically saying oh well you're trying to you know you're trying to regiment my creativity and they, they they were resistant to the notion that you needed to become technical but actually as we started working with the methods um people came to realize that it's the opposite if you try to be, you know, like people talk about the, you know, the 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 blank, and I'm not sure if that's the name in English, the blank page syndrome, you know, or whatever. Like as a writer, you know, the image of a writer puts a, a page on his machine, and then he's like, "I'm going to write an amazing story," and then he goes like, "One day," and then no, that's not good. Start again, you know. And so this, the idea that if, and we did this in class, like in design class, I would do this often. I would give. A mandate to uh, to students. I would tell them, and it's a trap, by the way. I would tell them, okay, guys, we're going to do a game design exercise. Everybody's going to design an inventory system. Okay, we're, and I and I tell them, let's start with something simple, but it's a trap, right? Build an inventory system. So just write, like, go go home next week. Bring me back a page where you describe to me the most amazing inventory system you can think of. Thank you. Have a good week. And I, and I leave them at that. And of course, the poor people in the class, they come back and they're all excited, you know, it's for a sort of design assignment. I do this early in the session. They bring me back all these pages. And then I say, okay, now we're going to do something. I'm going to pick three pages randomly from this pile. I'm going to read them to you. I'm going to, I'm going to read them. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys about the most amazing inventory systems we can think of. And then I pull it out and I start reading. And as you can probably expect by now in my explanation, it's a, it, the results are, are horrible. The results are, are shit. And people kind of, and, and it only sinks, it sinks in the more I'm reading. The more I read these pages, the more it sinks in that, yeah, this is really not, this is really not interesting. Or is it me or every single inventory system we just heard of sounds like it costs $10 million and it's not really achieving anything. It's just like everyone is is throwing everything they've seen in every game and just piling up. 
and then this inventory is, is everything is in 3D and you can turn the objects around and you can examine and combine and upgrade and scale and break down and craft like and it becomes like inventory system the game really quickly right and then i tell them about what the trap was the trap was i gave them a stupid assignment without constraint um and so the, the issue is this if you don't have constraint um, then you cannot create. And so the idea of rational design and being technical in design is this ex idea exactly, is how do I take something that people perceive is the realm of ideas and you bring them over to something where they can solve an issue. So as a designer, the task was always about providing the right level of answer and not providing the right idea or looking for the good idea because that doesn't work. So at the time we started building this whole this whole curses. So we we look at the, how can you become technical as a designer? And part of the rational design was understanding understanding difficulty and understanding experience. And um, so we started looking at what makes a game difficult uh, or more or less difficult or more or less involving and really trying to understand by looking at other sciences how design could become a very well established field where we can uh, we can technically understand that and so in the end the question is um basically when you create something as a designer or when you create something as an artist or as a developer how do you inform and justify your choices so if as a developer, I tell you, I want you to help me code this inventory system, you need to understand why we're doing it. And you need to have a clear idea of the mandate. And so we started looking at a process um, of breaking down the conception. So for some of you, and I'm not sure what you have personally used in, uh, in, in your current or previous jobs, or even uh, if you did a game school, um, what kind of, of method you used. But for example, from a design perspective, and I talk a lot about design because that's where the project starts. That's where a lot of the fields, a lot of you guys that are working in engineering, art, or design, like it starts um, and a lot of it is informed by the decisions done in design. And so um, traditionally, we teach people to use a GDD. And I want to talk about this for a second because documentation is, I think it's, a, it's an important part of how we work. Um, so the GDD, and I'm sure a lot of you use this, it's this idea of creating this absolutely immense game design Bible, like you document that in, in Word, and it ends up being 250 pages of a, of a game. Um, and over time, we discovered basically that this is a wrong this is not the right way to approach the format. The issue with GDD is that it takes too long to produce. Um, most developers on the team don't really read the document so well in detail. And even for a designer, imagine that I ask you to be right, to be absolutely right on the first go. And that, that is not reasonable for any profession, uh, design, art, or code. We, we need to shift the approach to a fail fast, succeed sooner approach. And this is something hopefully that you use in your work already as a mindset. And again, this sounds very, I sound like Cap Captain Obvious saying this, but it's been very hard to get developers to switch over at, the, uh, at that time to a mindset where I expect you to fail. So don't try to tell me that it's, everything you do is gonna be great because I wanna know how you're gonna fail first. And this is something that uh, it required changing the mindset. And in design, you have a lot of people that work with ego as well, right? And they, they want to project the image that they're in control. But it's really the opposite. So we said, OK, so let's not build the GDD, because GDD asks the designer to be right on the first. And then the coder is going to take the, the details from the GDD, and we expect them to be right as well on the first time. Because by the time we're done, we don't have any time left to iterate. And that, that, was a, that was a notion that we needed to break, to break off. So the way we work now is we have broken down using the stage gate process. Um, we have broken down the development into these 
these phases, right? So like a preconception, conception, pre-production, production, and eventually uh, we ship. And so we've we've mixed. So it is it's not agile. It's not an agile approach per se. It's it is still sequential. It is still a waterfall. But we want to de-risk things. So um, I guess I'll show you quickly um, an overview of something here. So be careful. You're going to see our faces again. I want to show you really quickly um, something here. So the idea, um, and that's just an overview of the way we document stuff. And it, it shows how we we break down the, the stages of the production, um, the stage gates, right? So one issue that you will find in a lot of companies um, that work with pitches, or if, for example, we, we do what's called RFP. So um, a publisher issues a request for proposal, and then they ask for developers to pitch, right? That's a very traditional way to work um, on work for hire and sometimes partnerships. The issue traditionally you find in a lot of those companies is that there isn't a clear link between the pitch process and the actual production process. So you have the issue where um, people do the pitch. There's like these two guys in a room. They do the pitch. They sell it. The pitch works. You get a contract. And now that thing, the pitch itself is handed over to a development team. And then you expect that team to be able to work the product, which, which of course doesn't work at all because the pitch is very often built in a way that is not really workable or it's not a good seed or the good start for a project. So we wanted to sort of create a process where we can go from the pitch and tr transition over the ownership of the project to the team who's going to build it. And so the first thing that we build off of that is what's called the HLD. So the high level document is like a vision document basically, right? So it's this it's this thing that's curated by the creative director, the art director, the technical director, but it, it involves a lot of people from the core team for the initial team. And they build this huge sort of PowerPoint document thing. And that's meant to convey a very clear vision of what the project should be. And that's why it's important that it starts by looking at here, you know, I write like brand pillars, player fantasy, things like that. So you need to make sure that people understand the why first. And you're already solving, you're already killing in its egg the, the issue of ego and the issue of doing things in your game because you think they're cool. Because what you're creating is a, is like a, a, a table, you know, like the like the table of law, you know, written in stone that says this game is about X, Y, and Z. The experience is about X, Y, and Z. And I'll use an example that I think is really interesting. Um, and most people don't realize this. If you look at Grand Theft Auto as a franchise, um, if you ask people, what is Grand Theft Auto about? Um, most people will tell you it's about like being a gangster and that's the way they perceive the game but if you ask the guys working on the team working on that brand for years now if you ask them what is it really about they're going to tell you actually the game is about being a tourist and so of course there's a layer of, of realization and veneer that is about the gangster life and you know whatever however they want to portray that but the experience of the game the, the real why is about being a tourist. So the way that the different locations are made, the way their marketing campaign is built, everything is actually trying to lure you over as a tourist. Come and be a tourist of this amazing immersive world. So this level of, um, of creation requires for you to segment things in a certain way. And this is what DHLD is trying to do. And by the time you have that, you're able to do a proper kickoff and start a conception phase in a game. And so here again, quickly as an overview, you'll see that the GDD doesn't exist. It's been killed and replaced by many different documents that are meant to be created and proposed at the right time. So as an example here, everything I told you about, and that comes from the initial program we did at Ubisoft back in the days, the rational design process is the technical game design stuff. So it's mostly invisible for, um, for a lot of the other devs even. But we need to make sure that the designers are thinking rationally and technically about their work. So they do a lot of documentation around that. And this is meant to feed back into the mid-level stuff, so the MLDs.
So imagine instead of having a 250 word document about the whole game, you split this into a mapping of all the different features, all the different topics, right? So if you do GTA, you have, you know, the locations, enemies, the weapons, the progression system, the vehicles, the, the, the day and night cycle, the police, you know, all these different systems are broken down. Each one has its own MLD. And the MLD is always telling a story. So it's still only a PowerPoint tells a story. And this is presented to everyone on the team. So everyone gets the story and then they can raise flags, ask questions. And then we have this loop between the rational design stuff, the mid-level design stuff. And all the while we're basically making discoveries about where will we fail first? And this is where we need prototypes. Or what's the biggest question? Like maybe you have a super big question, you need an answer. That becomes a prototype. So again, the idea is that you don't want to just go out and prototyping is often used as an excuse for devs that don't know what they're doing. They just say, oh, you know, let's prototype. And then in the end, they take every prototype they have and they stick it back in the game because they don't have any, any time left. So in order to, to fix this, we're saying, well, prototypes need a, a clear plan that comes from the MLDs, come from the rational process, and then we have a prototype plan that we start you know, building. And lastly, super important piece, which is at the bottom here, it's the FSO, the feature sign off, which has been used. It's a, it's a method that comes from some of the, like we use them on, on Assassin's Creed, Far Cry, like all the, the big brands and Ubisoft use this. And, we, and we've refined the process and we keep using this. And this is really important for devs, for, for tasking on a project, for QA as well. So this is the low level specs the low level details of everything. Because again, you've had the vision document at first. Everyone agrees on it, great. And you go in conception. Okay, we have the MLDs, everyone agrees on the story. Okay, great, we have some prototypes. But before we actually start building stuff, we need proper design specs. And this is an Excel sheet that breaks down every single little piece of tasking you need for a feature. But it comes last. And it comes at the right time, and that's really important. So you don't end up, you reduce the risk of scrapping a whole feature over and having to start again, um, which I hope always happens, but you want to minimize, minimize that, right? So the idea is that you start doing the FSOs, and during pre-production, you do all the prototypes, you, you figure out how you're going to do the game, you finish up the FSOs. So when you go into production, everyone knows what to do. Every question is answered. Of course, that's not always the case, but you try to be able to really ramp up production and take the worry away because production is hard, right? It's a hard grind. It's everyone in the trenches. So you want to de-risk a lot of that. And then um, by the time you, 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 you hit that spot, everyone has failed very often. Design has failed. They've redone the MLD six times, redone the prototypes, changed the FSO. Everyone has failed often. And then you discover that that sort of recipe that you're looking for and you're able to go straight into production, right? So, um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing now. So the idea here is really to, again, it's formalizing design as a trade and level design, understanding the player, the science, the psychology behind players, the science of, of difficulty and interaction, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also applying that approach to, to the game development pipeline as a whole and, and so we're also approaching publishing the same way. So we're building a publishing pipeline um, to be able to work with developers and have a clear understanding of what developers need to provide us and when and how we can help in iterating um, everything they, they deliver. So ultimately, like the idea is this, we, we wanna, and, and, and Jake said um, about trying to rule some of those some of the offer of AA gaming through crossplay. To, so to, there's like a strong technological bed to the products that we're trying to do. But all the while, we want to make sure that we can either build ourselves or help other teams build a product that is focusing on the right things and, and, and solving a lot of the bullshit that comes with any creative endeavor. <laughs> um, and that's really... In a nutshell, that's our goal. So that's where we stand. And I'll stop now because otherwise I'll go too long. I want to make sure we have time for question two.
you were doing great, Alexis. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, guys, we are going to start to explain. I thank you so much, Alexis, and also Jacob, for, for the introduction and for this talk. If you have any questions, now is the time to do them, either in the chat or in the Q&A, because now we have an eye on the chat, so we won't lose any questions. The first one is, what is the best way for a senior developer that has never implemented a game to start on game development? With a plan. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we use, internally, we use the rational design process. So, so we use HLDs, FSOs, MLDs, and we've adopted this process. Um, I can't tell you how many game developers I've seen that just start coding or programming or prototyping or doing whatever it is that they're going to do. And what they discover um, sometime late in production is that without a plan, it's um, it's a complete mess, and you know there's no clear goals. They're not trying to achieve anything. So I think that um, in all cases, and I don't want to speak for Alexi, where I've seen success is it started with a really solid plan. We're trying to, you know, again we use an HLD process where we get uh, agreement by our own staff, uh, all of the people that are going to be participating in it. Uh, of what it is that we're trying to achieve, right? The, what's the high-level design? Um, you know, we're going to be teaching at uh, university. Um, we're, we're trying to work with the Portugal uh, University there in Lisbon as well to start teaching these classes. Regardless of whether or not you use an HLD plan, you use a GDD, a game design document, whatever it is that you're going uh, to do, having a, a codex, having a core idea of what it is that you're trying to achieve here's and here's what people are working on to try and achieve that goal it gives you something to measure against and then to improve mm. and actually i want to i want to add on top of that from a creative standpoint um this is really hard like the issue i i see very often and i the advice i try to give uh because again regardless of 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 what's your sort of job that you're looking for. Like a lot of people touch on the creative when building a proposition, building a pitch, or even if they want to work on a game by their own, there's all, of course, there's a whole creative aspect involved. And the issue that I, I see very often, and, and so I try to advise against that is <clears throat> if you're building a game proposal, or if you're building a pitch, or if you're documenting your own idea for a game, um, the details, like the actual content, has no value if you don't know the why. And what I mean by this is very often I'll get proposals or whether it's even like students or colleagues or people pitching ideas, whatever it is. Even internally, we have this process where everyone is encouraged to come up to me and say, well, I had this idea of how, maybe they're working on something, but they have an idea in their in their drawer for a few years and they just want to have the exercise of playing with it and it's always the same thing they're going to come up to and they're going to show me the game like a bit like the gd or whatever like a game I, here's my game idea and it it starts it, it's telling me like this game has you know eight classes and each class has three weapons and here's a table with the weapon damage it's like it's it's like a full game design detail breakdown and i always have the hard job of telling them i don't care and you know, I do it as a bit as a, as a <laughs> pr provocative thing to say, but it's it's true. Like that, the issue is never having those. Like eventually, you will come down to the moment where you design those, and designing those is actually not really the hard part. The hard part is having a cohesive, and it goes in link to what Jake was saying. Because cohesive plan is true creatively, and it's true. From a production and from a from a development standpoint, it's true on all levels. Like, what's the big idea? What's the why? How do you break it down? And eventually, okay, maybe you have some ideas specific, and then you can put them in. But what if, like, we actually do this game? By the time we're gonna hit that point, maybe we're gonna replace every detail you put. We're gonna throw away, and you're gonna do it again. It doesn't matter. Like, as as long as you you go down in that in that order. So. Always try to work with the strong why, and don't get buggled down in a, in a specific ideas because you're gonna fail and change them six times. 
So I, I think that's an important thing to say. Yeah, thank you so much. We have people in the chat saying like, life is a game and start small and focus. So I guess that's the question. Actually, we have a question that is, how did you start? How can one, a person start a gaming company? Uh, that's easy. You just sort of hang out your shingle and say, I'm going to do it. Um, okay. I think very often there's a belief that game development is easy. Um, and I can't tell you how many like very senior level executives have gone, ah, this is really simple. Like people at Microsoft, people at Amazon, like really seasoned veterans. And what I, I think a lot of people fail to, to understand and recognize is that gaming is pushing technology in many ways and in, in every direction from memory utilization to graphics cards to processing power to new ways of visualizing amazing things and and still having fun and you know enterprise software right financial services these are built on pieces of technology that are 10 years old that are tried and true that are rock solid that don't fall over game development is about you know driving your car to the red line until it's a, the engine's about to explode, but not letting the engine explode. Um, so game development, starting a game company, you, you get one or two people together and you start uh, with a process and you start uh, building a game in your nights and evenings. It's easy to start, um, but finishing is the hard part. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that there's not a single developer that shipped a title that won't tell you the second 80% of the game, right? From alpha to finish is really where it's hard. And actually, you know, like very often when you start companies and this is really dependent on where you live, like I think the, you know, like the, the, the commercial and industrial reality is varied a lot from territory to territory. But so depending on where you are, you, of course, you're going to know about your own ecosystem. Like what are the programs that, that can finance me? If I come up with, a, with an idea for like this three guy company, I, guy and, and gals, obviously. Um, like, wh who can I talk to? What do I need? How do I get finance? Like, because it, it really starts, like, if you want to really start something that you need to know, okay, there's this government fund that I can apply to, and, the, and here are, like, the requirements. And then, yeah. okay, we need to make a game, like, I don't know, we need to make it, if we, if we integrate something about climate change, we can get <laughs> an extra, an extra 12 grand, because there's this new program that, no, I'm not kidding. That's how small companies start. So they, one strong idea, you look for the hooks you can hook yourself to. And you, and it's like we said before, one, like someone said, small but focused, absolutely small but focused. It's one strong idea, the why clearly explain the one year, two year plan. You, you can dream, you can put bullshit numbers, but you need to show that this is what we're going to do in two years. And this is the why, and this is how, you know, you we want to convince you to help us. And then you, you get funded as a small company. And then depending on how that goes, you close, start again, or you do something else. But uh, I mean, um, but for sure, what Jake said, like we used to have <laughs> about the shipping, shipping project. We, we always said, right, like start, like again, getting the job is easy and uh, for every profession. Finishing the project is the hard thing. People, when shit hits the fan, and it will, that's where people either stay in and and they they you know bunker down and ship it or they leave. And the reality, yeah, and I've seen this in big companies where people move from project to project. If you always leave when it's hard, you don't get reassigned on another project. You people leave you to die because you left at the critical moment. So we even had, we used to have guys playing, you know, music, like music, like amateur musician, the day, game devs would come in and they would play, gotta ship it, da -da 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 -da. gotta ship it. And they, they would play this on the floor when things got really hard, because it was a reminder, like guys, we, at, this, at a certain point, we just have to ship it. And it's, it is the hardest thing to do. And if you're three friends in a, in a, in a, in a basement, it's going to be even harder because you don't have all, all these. You can't ask around for all these amazing resources. You got to do everything yourself and ship it. So it's going to be really hard to finish. Thank you so much for, for your questions. 
We also have one here um, regarding, because Jacob said in the beginning that you had um, a game jam and someone is asking for a global game jam. Would it be possible? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, <laughs> remind me afterwards and, and I'll, I'll tie you in. It's, it's actually run by IGDA. So the International Game Developers Association sponsors the event annually. Ourselves, Microsoft, many others uh, participate in it. Again, this is one of the things I've been talking with uh, the Develop Portugal uh, folks about is doing something in Portugal uh, at the local universities, both in Tamar and in Lisbon, um, or Porto, Tamar, or Lisbon. Um, anyhow, so yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that we we very much want to be engaged with people uh, as they're you know sort of finishing their 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 degrees and encouraging game development. You know, uh, if you're a good engineer, a good producer, a good designer, there's always an opportunity to join QA. And in QA, many, many, many people uh, find careers in games by starting in the, the QA department, quality assurance, customer service, because you get to understand what the game development process is, looks like and, and sort of all the ugly warts that come out of game development and all the things that break. And you get to discover where you wanna be. I'm a designer, I'm an engineer, I'm an artist, I'm a producer, whatever. Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, this year it's done, but um, we are actively interested in uh, Portugal being uh, another area where we would do a global game jam. You'd compete with you know other uh, college campuses that we're sponsoring around the world. Um, the first one was in Mexico. Next year, hopefully we'll also have one in Portugal. Nice. We hope so. And we hope to see you all in Lisbon at least if we can. I yes. get my vaccine this month, so hopefully I'll be allowed to travel. Oh, look oh. at you. Yes. I'm an old you, you guy. Old people get the vaccine, so. One day, one day. Um, yeah, there's, there's actually mention. Yeah, they mentioned that the global game jam is is present in Portugal in many locations, like like uh, well, to, yeah. like it is already. But I think we we want to be able to, and I've worked on uh, different formats as well. And I've actually I, I ran I ran six editions in France of a something called the game challenge, which is like a like a, a game jam, but on on a hard mode on a hard difficulty. It's a for, it's like a yeah. form a formula I've, I've created, and I. We've spoken that like we would we would want to be able to run other editions of this uh, from a you know by TLM. Uh, it's it's very different than than uh, than the GGJ, but uh, we'll see we'll see how we can do this in the future. Okay, nice. Someone was asking, um, what engines do you use? Um, so we very much like Unreal. Um, depending on the company, we've. You know, we'll, we'll use the Fire Engine, we'll use the Cry Engine, uh, we will use um, custom engines in, in house. Um, on Call of Duty, that's a Radiant Engine, uh, which is actually a 25 year old Quake 1 engine that's just evolved over time. Um, we could, but we don't use Unity um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think most of the AAA games these days are, are Unreal, so that's sort of where our focus is. Okay, and we also had a question, um, if, does it really matter if you choose a certain game engine from the start, Unity, Unreal, wherever, does that influence your development process? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're radically different. Um, I mean, I think at the end of the day, they've got you know, similar systems for prototyping and you know, Blueprint on Unreal, and, and I forget what it's called on, on Unity. Unity is an easy end. The licensing model is very different. Um, the engine doesn't matter for your game design. So, you know, back in the day, Sid Meier's used to prototype all of his um, civilization games in Excel using Visual Basic. And what he cared about was watching the simulation until it was fun. And so he'd have all these little counters for people and gold and all these different resources. And he'd sit there and stare for weeks at these spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets using Visual Basic until it was fun. And then he'd bring people in to look at the, and until he found the fun, he didn't even start programming the game. So I, I, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna say again, 
finding the fun and, and having a plan of what you're going to do in development, whether you use an HLD, rational design process, or some other process, but really having a plan is the difference between a hobby and creating a game. Okay, thank you so much. Um, just to, to wrap up our session, Dietmar, I understand you are growing our team and you are looking for, for some roles. Can you share with us with which jobs you have open right now? Also for our audience, if they are interested. Yeah. Yes, That's... we are having the same audio problem as in the I'm testing. So I'm sorry, is muted, but what I will say is um, please go to our website. Uh, we have over 40 head uh, count that are open. Um, we are looking at uh, designers. Uh, mostly we're looking for engineers. Um, we also have some production roles, some, some uh, producer uh, types of roles. Um, we are just now starting an office in Romania to do uh, QA and quality assurance. And uh, again, providing COVID will allow us to travel into Lisbon, our intention is to actually open up an office in, in uh, Portugal. So. Yes, if you want, you can also check the jobs on Learning Jobs. We are also partnering up to make it possible for you to, to have an office here. So to our audience, this session is being recorded, so you can watch it in the same link that you used to access the session. You can watch it over and over again, So and you can share it with everyone. Thank you for, for being here. Also, thank you, Alexis and Dietmar and Jacob for, uh, for the session. Thank it you. was really thank good. You. I hope to see you soon in an event, um, either in person or, or online, whatever. Um, to our audience, thank you so much. Um, you can reach out to any of our speakers in LinkedIn, I believe. I just, I just put yes, it out of there. Of course, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> Thank you so much once all again. Right. And uh, this session is going to, to end, and we are all going to, to exit uh, the room, okay? All right. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Yes, remote. Yes, yes. Jimena, yes, remote. remote. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> cloud, cloud, remote. Let's do it. Thank all you right. so much, everyone. Thanks.